my channel. Welcome back to another video. I'm Jessie and you're watching. Welcome to the latest episode of Books That Wasted My Time where I talk about books that took literal years off of my life. The entertainment for this evening is none other than The Power by Naomi Alderman. A book that is so beloved and adored has made it onto so many best books lists. It is frequently described and hailed as a fantastic feminist speculative fiction novel. And I simply would love to know what novel y'all are reading. Did I get the wrong edition? Did I get the arc? Did I get the rough draft? Is there another book called The Power that has the similar premise? And perhaps I just picked up the wrong book. Perhaps I picked up this book's evil twin. It is frequently described as a modern day hands made tale, which honestly doesn't surprise me given how narrow the feminism is in The Handmaid's Tale too. So honestly, that should have told me everything that I needed to know going into this book. The fact that so many of y'all were like, yeah, Hands Made Tale, which was the whitest, most Western feminism I have ever read in my entire life. The fact that so many of y'all were boosting this book up because of its similarities to The Handmaid's Tale should have told me. It should have been enough to warn me. I picked up this book all excited, mad hype, super geeked, and I know my ancestors were up in heaven like, you think we should warn them? We should tell them, right? On second thought, we should just maybe just see how this plays out. My ancestors let me down by allowing me to read this book. They didn't even try to warn me. They said that the warning was right here. Mar Margaret Atwood herself described this as electrifying. Electrify. First of all, I never want to hear another one of y'all critique my bad puns. I know that they're bad, but this, if, I don't want to talk about it. I'm so mad that y'all made me read this book. This speculative science fiction novel seeks to answer the question of what would happen if women and girls gained the power to electrocute overnight. This premise is wildly exciting. The book promised to explore power dynamics between men and women, specifically how those power dynamics would shift in the wake of women suddenly gaining the upper hand. I was very excited for that commentary. That's not what we got though. Before I get into my criticisms for The Power, let us begin this video by talking about all the good in this novel. Alderman did many things well in The Power and I can truly see why this is such a beloved story. One of my favorite things about this novel is how deeply the world building was crafted. The foundation for the world building was done so cleverly presenting this novel as history itself. So throughout the book, you will see illustrations and archaeological data that serve the purpose of establishing this story as a piece of history, making it feel more realistic. Basically, the reader gets the sense that they are a student in college and they are reading about this period in history. They are reading about what happened when women gained this power, as well as looking at different archaeological finds throughout history that support the evolution of this power. So so you will have illustrations such as this that modern archaeologists have dug up and discovered that show how throughout history, well before our time, there was evidence of women having had this power. Women didn't just gain this power overnight. This is actually an evolutionary adaptation. I feel like I explained that in the most convoluted way possible, but I'm not sure how to make that any more straightforward. Hopefully it makes sense. And that's just the foundation for the world building. I also truly appreciated that this power was not fantastical, but rather was scientific and evolutionary in origin. Women and girls have developed this skein that rests along their collarbone and allows them to exert electrical impulses. 
It is literally a development of anatomy. Girls first develop it and are able to then wake up this power in other women. So if a girl who has a skein touches a woman and shocks her, it then wakes up the skein in that woman's biology. And I thought that was freaking awesome. I loved that this became an evolutionary adaptation versus pure magic. And the explanation of the skein and how it worked was so freaking cool. Furthermore, everyone's skein is different. All skeins are not created equal, which I appreciated because skeins are just as diverse as the human body is, meaning that some people have more powerful skeins than others. Some people have skeins that are defective and work only half of the time. Other people have skeins that barely exert any power at all. And that is caused by your genetics and so many other factors. It was more personalized to the character and the character's individual body. Another of my favorite things regarding this novel was the absolute pandemonium that broke out across the world when girls are found to have this power, how quickly the power spreads and how every society is turned on its head as a result of this. And the exploration of that was so cool. Logistics down to the most minute level were ironed out these systems that are then put in place to protect boys from girls. The way that this power impacts the workplace and families, just every aspect of everyday life was changed by girls developing the power. And all of those aspects were explored just with, with such care and detail. The world building in this book is truly phenomenal. You can see it on the internet. Boys dressing as girls to seem more powerful. Girls dressing as boys to shake off the meaning of the power or to leap on the unsuspecting, a wolf in sheep's clothing. It wouldn't have even occurred to me that boys might begin to dress as girls. That sentence perfectly exemplifies the detail and craft that Alderman sunk into her world building. Also very interesting were the differing perspectives, the different narrators we were following in this story. We have Tunde who is a black journalist detailed on traveling the world to capture all of this as it unfolds. We also have a biracial girl who escapes an abusive household and basically becomes a prophet, starts a church, and gains an insane following because she is able to use her powers to heal the sick. Then we also have the daughter of a infamous crime family who is leading her own organization. So these individuals could not be more different and I loved the way that their stories were brought together and I felt the book greatly benefited from having narrators that were so different from one another. Unfortunately that's all the good that I have to say about this book so where do I even start? Let's talk about Tunde. Tunde had two purposes in the story. One was to report on the action and two was to be lusted after. If I had to hear one more description of a white woman salivating over Toon Day, his character was so flat. And I read so many reviews where people were like, oh, I really love Toon Day's character. He was one of the strongest characters. Where? Where? You tell me one thing about his backstory. What was his favorite food? Is he a morning person or a night person? What's his sexual identity? What drives him? And yes, you could say that his work drives him, but why was he attracted to that field in the first place? There is very little, very little given to us about this man. And normally, I really wouldn't care about that. I would be like, that's fine. He could be his own flat side character. I really don't care. But my issue was that this was the whole, in the whole novel, this was the one brother we had representation for. The whole, the whole novel. And he just was this beautiful, sexy piece of chocolate who was just running around. And his character was problematic AF as well because his purpose essentially, where he decided to focus, I'm gonna tell you the real reason that Tunde's character was in this novel. And to be honest, I don't even know if Naomi realized that this was the function of this character because I think that if she did, she would not have written him the way that she did. Tunde's entire character, the purpose of this man is to show us how awful and evil Muslim men are to their women and to show us how much more brutal violence against women is outside of the West. That was the function of him. Because notice how he was the character used in order to talk about those issues with women, served entirely to criticize how non-Western men of color brutally oppressed women. None of the white characters did that. 
And even the biracial black and white character had nothing to do with non-Western women of color. And they never addressed any issues of women of color. That burden fell specifically to Tunde. And I wouldn't have had an issue with Tunde as a man of color being used to talk about the perils of BIPOC women under patriarchal rule. I would not have had an issue with that if he had been given a character. That was his character. Alderman really said, okay, the white characters can't critique brown men, but a black man can, and then Tunde was born. I was not impressed. I was not impressed. And that wasn't even my biggest issue. My biggest issue is that the, the, the driving force of the feminism, what drives the feminism in this novel at its heart, it just was the whitest feminism ever. And I don't mean that it, that it centered only white women. Yo, I wouldn't have even been that mad about it. I, I truly wouldn't. What upset me is then you went and then you had to bring Eastern folks into it. And then Eastern men were so deeply vilified in this novel. There is a scene, yo, there is a scene where, let me, let me find this freaking scene. I could not believe this. I was like, who, where was the sensitivity reader? Where was the sensitivity reader? I am willing to bet this full right here that this book was not sensitivity read by a Muslim person, by a Pakistani woman, by an Indian woman. None, none of that. I can guarantee you that they were not present in this process because I'm absolutely certain that at least one of them would have been like, I know you're not talking about my culture. I can't. I cannot. I absolutely cannot. There is a scene and I don't even know if I can waste my time finding it. I'm fucking screaming. The women in places like Delhi are literally setting cars on fire, exploding them. And these scenes are depicted as being full of anger and rage and justifiable rage at what these women are facing. But that is not at all paralleled. None of that is brought to the United States. At no point in the US, at no point in the UK, does anything similar happen. The book treats it as now these deeply oppressed Muslim women have risen above their oppressors and are gonna turn the country upside down as a result. The challenging of the patriarchy was much more civilized and laid back um, and calculated and meticulous, organized in the West. It's an age old dynamic that I just, I just can't stand it. I'm so sick of this narrative, the patriarchy being worse in places where the culture doesn't mirror ours. And the reason that that bothers me is because it inherently villainizes that culture. It says, hey, your culture is inherently more patriarchal than ours and completely ignores the fact who set up the patriarchy in the first place. Who benefits the most from the patriarchy? White men. And I think that that is very disturbing. And I'm not saying that everything was gravy before white supremacy. That's not at all what I'm saying. Men have exerted power over women throughout the world since the time of remembering, but that is a whole other video. This book deserves the electric chair electric chair. So we go through all of that, yeah? And the message that we get here is that if the tables were turned, women would do the exact same thing to men. Women become these violent, power-hungry beasts. I think that so much more could have been done with this premise, and I wanted more. It felt like a cop-out. It felt as if the author was trying to create just a sensational story without giving us any of the meat. What systems would women put in place? What could women create after years of being oppressed by men and to finally be liberated, what would women's vision for the world be? Those are questions that could have been explored and I wish that they had been explored at all, but also with the same care that Naomi went into building this world. I know she's capable of it. The world building, like I said, is spectacular. She's shown herself to be brilliant and imaginative, but when it comes to the feminism, the book falls incredibly flat. It has such a narrow scope it is entirely unimaginative in its feminism. And I found that so strange considering that this is a feminist novel. Besides the fact that the feminism is very Western, is very white, absolutely erases anybody who is queer, non-binary, trans, disabled. The feminism objectively is just poor. It's poor if you are not able-bodied white and living in the United States. Let's do what Naomi Alderman clearly is trying to do and just pretend that none of those things really matter. Okay, let's, let's pretend that. After crafting all of that, the message that you want to send 
is that anybody with power is immediately going to use that to oppress others doesn't sit well with me. And it's not because I am naive and think that there can ever be peace when a group of people has significantly more power than another group. Because I know that that's not true. As somebody who is black and queer and non-binary, et cetera, I know that that's not true. Now, I'm not saying traditionally disenfranchised people, dispossessed people are just inherently fucking angels because if you look at the formation of Liberia, what happened in Monrovia where a bunch of ex-slaves from America went over to Liberia and then immediately oppressed the indigenous. Yeah, so of course, marginalized people who then get power are not just inherently going to do anything different. However, I think we could have explored what happened if what would it have looked like if when women gained their absolute power, they reflected upon these decades, generations of oppression and said, we need to put checks and balances in place to prevent us from doing unto others as been done to us. And I'm not saying the book had to end, you know, happy go lucky. I really resent that we didn't even get to see a potential for peace. We didn't even get to see women trying to build a better world than the one that they had been given. They just slowly descended into fucking madness. All over the world. You can't tell me that at least one country wouldn't have done something different. I don't know. Let me know in the comment section down below if you think that I'm being too idealistic, if you think that I'm being too optimistic. I don't know. I would genuinely love to hear a perspective that's not my own. This book wasted my time and nothing is going to convince me otherwise but I'm not going to be offended if you're like hey this was my analysis and I have a different opinion from you that's why I make booktube videos is because I like having these discussions I do not make booktube videos because I think that my opinion is perfect because I don't and I absolutely love when y'all leave comments critiquing my analyses and I realize that I had a gap in knowledge like I think that that's really freaking cool I just I will never get that time back. If you made it to the end of this video, comment down below with the lightning emoji or the word lightning for obvious reasons. My next Books That Wasted My Time video is going to feature The Ancient Nine, which is a story about a black man in the 1980s getting indoctrinated into a secret society at Harvard. It is a thriller. This book got a one star from me while The Power ended up getting a two star rating from me simply because of the fantastic world building, the innovative premise. Yeah, th those, those two, those were the, those were the two things. The two things. If you want more content from me, you can follow me on my Instagram, Bowties and Books, but all of my social media links will be in the description box below. Until next time, stay safe, wear your mask, and I can't wait to see you in my next video.